The following program contains strong sexual content. Viewer discretion is advised. All new Dr. Phil. Ariel Castro held three women captive for 10 years. Inside the Cleveland kidnappings. You were in the basement chained to the pole with a helmet on, chains around your neck. Almost too brutal to believe. What happened in that room? Today, for the first time, the first victim. Was he afraid you would yell out? Speaks out. Yeah, that's the reason why he taped my mouth shut. What did he use? Duct tape, and he'll put a dirty, nasty sock in my mouth. Michelle Knight. I picked the lock, and I tried to escape. And he says, now you're going to be punished. A Dr. Phil exclusive. He said, when I get two other girls in the house, then I'll let you go. Did you have any idea when you walked through that front door that it would be 11 years before you would walk back out? Now, from Cleveland, Ohio, here's Dr. Phil. She was the forgotten victim. The one girl who emerged from the house that once stood right here that no one knew, no one cared about. There had been no missing posters for her, no candlelight vigils. But today, in an exclusive interview, her story will be told. No one will forget the day three women were freed, surviving more than a decade in captivity. Today, we're going inside the news story that shocked and captivated the nation. One man is now being held responsible for more than a decade of horror. Three young women apparently held captive vanished in their teens or early 20s. Help me, I'm Amanda Berry. I've been kidnapped and I've been missing for 10 years and I'm, I'm here, I'm free now. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Cheers and sheer joy on Seymour Avenue upon the news. I knew she would come home. Amanda Berry, Gina De Jesus, and Michelle Knight are all safe and sound tonight. Ariel Castros, the former school bus driver, is now the sole suspect in the investigation. Authorities say the victims spent much of their captivity bound, either in the basement or on the second floor of Castro's house. Castro pleaded guilty to 937 criminal counts, including murder for ending Michelle Knight's pregnancy. Castro will face life in prison without the possibility of parole plus 1,000 years. Today, Michelle Knight breaks her silence. She was Ariel Castro's first victim and is the first of his three captives to speak out. Since her release, you'll see that Michelle has gotten several piercings as a symbol of her newfound freedom. She may be small in stature, but has enormous strength and spirit. I'm really proud to be sitting here talking to you, and it's really an honor to meet you. I'm so glad that you're telling your story, and I, I want people to know everything you want them to know. And I would kind of like to start at the beginning, and you know, some of this is not a pretty story. I'd like to talk about your life before this tragedy. Oh, that, tragedy. Was a, that was a horror tragedy. Tell me why you say it was horrible. In my case, I wished that my mother wasn't my mother. Is that why you did not want to see your mother when you were yes. released? I haven't seen her in so long, and I can't wait to see her. Because she was my daughter and my best friend. You, you had no desire to see that woman. When you went missing on that day, what she told the police is that you suffered from mental abnormalities and that she is confused of her surroundings a lot. The only reason why I'm confused of my surroundings because I wasn't allowed out. I wasn't allowed to have friends. She made sure that I was dumber than a doorknob just to get the SSI money. Right. But I'm not dumb. Half of the time I didn't even go to school. Because she wanted to make sure that I didn't know anything. You're obviously very intelligent. You read well. You've read my book. You read Self Matters, right? Yeah. Thank you for that. I by loved the way. it. Well, thank you. And that's not an easy book to read, as you know. No. <laughs> You've overcome some horrific things and still developed your mind and your personality and your talent. And you should be so proud of that. Now, tell me about getting pregnant with your son. That was. Amazing. 
I loved my son with all my heart. Now, when your son was two years old, he was injured by your mother's boyfriend? Yes. Tell me what happened. My mother's boyfriend came home one day, high and drunk, and just decided to take out his frustrations on my son. And how did he hurt him? He twisted my son's leg, and I heard it crack. My son didn't scream. He didn't cry. Just looked at me and said, Mommy, help me. Thank you. So at some point, they came in and said, the child's not safe in this home. Yeah. And so they took your baby. And then they tried to say that I never protected him, and I did. I did all I could do. On the day that you were, that you were taken by Ariel Castro, mm -hmm. you were walking to an appointment with social services. Okay, Michelle, we're at the dollar store on Clark Street, right? Mm -hmm. What happened here? This is where I was abducted from. And you live about how far from here, your house at the time? Right down a block. And you had walked from there, and you were going to check on the custody issue with your son, right? Yes. You got lost. I proceeded to walk through this door. Okay. And you went inside here. Yeah. And is is that where you were overheard? Yes. So we now know that he overheard you asking for direction. Yeah. And then the guy that was right beside me, he was like, "Well, I know where that's at." And I knew him because of Emily, which is his daughter. So I got in the car and I told him where I was going. And he said, okay, well, I gotta drop off at the house to make sure the puppies are okay. So I was like, all right, I'll sit in the car, you check them. Cause I didn't want to go in the house. We are on Seymour Avenue. Yes. And this is where this horrific event took place. This 11 years of hell for you. Did he pull up in the driveway? Mm -hmm. And he closed the gate and he went in the back and he went to the back door of his house. And you were still in the car? Yeah, and then he comes out and he tells me, well, just come in for a little while. The puppies are upstairs. You could take one home to your son. So I said, okay. How did you go in? Into the back door. So no one ever could see you going in the front door? No. But I did poke my head out, and I saw a bunch of people that lived in a previous house next to him. Okay. And I waved hi to them. Did they wave back? Mm-hmm. Wow. I looked around in the house, and I didn't hear any whining, so I started to get a little nervous. Then he was like, well, the puppies are upstairs, and I was like, I'm not going upstairs with you. He was like, well, if you want the puppy, you will come up. I finally like, gave in. I was like, oh, OK, I'll go upstairs with you. And then I seen Emily's picture. I was like, ah, oh, that's Emily. And I was like, is she here? And he was like, yeah, she's here. She's just right downstairs. So I was like, OK. So we go in there. We look for the puppies. The puppies are not there. So he trapped me in a room. And how did he trap you at that moment? He already had it set up to where he could tie me to the, uh, I think it's like a clothesline type of thing. And did he tie you to this? Yes. Did you have any idea when you walked through that door that it would be 11 years before you would walk back at it? No. Could you have ever dreamed or imagined as you stepped through that door that you would not breathe that air again for 11 years? No. Nope. So he gets you in this room. What did he tie you up with? One of those orange extension cords. I was tied up like a fish, an ornament on the wall. That's the only way I can describe it. I was hanging like this, my feet, and I was tied by my neck and my arms with um, the stench cord going like that. Oh, my God. So 
he tied your hands and feet and also around your neck and hung you from this rod? Yes. Did you fight him at the time? At the time, no, because I, didn't, I was shocked. You panicked, just froze? Yeah, and the only thing I can do is cry, begging him, let me go back to my son. What did you say to him? I said, please don't do this to me. And he said, I can. You can't take me back. And then he threw money at me. What was the significance of him throwing money at you? He was obsessed with prostitutes. And also, he thought I was a 13-year-old prostitute. When he found out my real age, he got mad. Why did that anger him? He wanted a child? Yes. Did he rape you at that point? No. He on my clothes, which was pretty disgusting, and left me there like that. So he masturbated, then he left? Yes. He told me before he left, he was like, you're only gonna be here as a friend, and that's it, and I'll let you go on Christmas. I never got home. Did you get the sense that you were not the first that he had taken? I want to be very clear regarding Michelle's childhood. Michelle's mother, Barbara Knight, absolutely disagrees with Michelle's recollections of those early years. She doesn't think she's lying, but she believes that her perception of events is distorted due to the trauma she has endured. Michelle's mother released this statement to us through her attorney. Michelle, my daughter, has been the victim of long-term and profound and unspeakable torture. Her point of view has been altered by that monster and what he did to her. What I have heard that she said about me breaks my heart. That is because what she now believes, though not true, increases her pain. I love my daughter, I always have and always will. I pray that someday she will have healed enough to know that again. We'll be right back. We now return to a Dr. Phil exclusive. Ariel Castro's first victim speaks out. Did you get the sense that you were not the first that he had taken? Yes. He said he had one other girl, but I'm not gonna tell you if she made it out alive. At this point, what are you thinking in your mind? You're hanging from this pipe. That I'll never get out of life. Let's talk about when he comes back, how long before he took you down? Maybe 24 hours. And when he came back through the door, what did you think was going to happen then? I thought I was going to get killed. And what did he do when he came back? Instead, in? he unties me, takes me to the basement, and he ties me up to a pole with chains wrapped around it. The chains were so big, and he wraps it around my neck. He sits me down on the floor, and he says, this is where you're going to stay until I can trust you. Now, if I do it too tight and you don't make it, that means you wasn't meant to stay here. That means God wants to take you. So he proceeded to put it around my neck, and then he tied it around my stomach. And he took my hands and bound it behind me. And he took a motorcycle helmet and he put it over my face to where I couldn't breathe at all. And later on, I didn't remember a thing because I had passed out. And when I finally woke up, he was not there. And I was searching around because I had went like this and broke the twisty ties that he had around my arm. There was no light, and I started looking around. So I finally found a pair of pliers and a wire cutter. So I started using it on the chain, and then I heard a car stop. This is when I got the chain from around my neck. He comes through the door, and he sits there and says, why did you take the chain off? Now you're going to be punished. And that's when he started hurting me. In what way? Sexually. And he took a pipe 
and he held it like this over my head and he said, if you scream, I'll ram this down your throat and I'll kill you. So I didn't scream, I didn't make a noise. I just laid there. The only thing I could say is let me go. And w when you would say let me go, what would he, what did he say? He said, when I get two other girls in the house, then I'll let you go. And I told him, no, you don't need to do that. I begged him not to bring any more there to suffer the hell I went through. Did he rape you at that point? Yeah. Did he hit you? Or he hit me twice because um, he started to do other sexual performances on me that calls for screaming. Did he have that helmet on you? No, not at the time. He took it off. How often and, and how long did you have to wear? The first three weeks I was in the house, I had to wear that. The first three weeks? Yeah. M may I show you a picture? It's okay. It's okay? Yeah. Okay, I'm just not going to do anything without your permission. Is this is this the pole he had you chained to? How do you feel when you look at that? I see everything he did to me in that picture. Some of these places where the paint's gone from the pole, is that from the chains? Yes. That's where I tried to get out, and I couldn't pull the pole down because I wasn't strong enough. May I show you another picture are these the chains? Yeah. So these heavy, rusty, filthy things were around your neck and, and your waist? Yeah. How did you go to the bathroom? He'll give me something like a bucket with a lid on it. Uh -huh. How long would he leave you there alone? Almost all day, but he always came home drunk. What would he do without having to be in detail? He'll hit me. He'll, uh, like, drag me by the chain, you know, stuff like that. There's, like, this one show that he watched constantly. It was about people that, you know, have really bad sexual problems. And he'll watch it, and then he'll want to do exactly what he sees on TV to other people. One of the fetishes was sexual pleasure was choking. So would he choke himself sometimes? No. Always you? Mm-hmm. When you were in the basement chained to the pole, did he leave clothes on you? At that time, the only thing I had on was a t-shirt and a pair of underwear. That's it. This is that downstairs area? Yeah. That's a very ugly whip in the side corner. Looking at that made me remember him whooping me with that. He would beat you with that? When you were down there, was it generally in the dark? There was no light, no light at all. And you just laid on the concrete floor in the dark? Well, it's kind of like being like this, because I couldn't lay down, because the pole would hold me up. Because of the chain around your yeah. neck? Were you able to sleep some? No, I just mainly passed out from the chain being around my neck. Did you ever hear anybody else in the house up there? Plenty of times. What did you hear? Coming up. Was he afraid you would yell out? Yeah, that's the reason why he taped my mouth shut. What did he use? Duct tape, and he'll put a dirty, nasty sock in my mouth. We now return to a Dr. Phil exclusive. Ariel Castro's first victim speaks out. Was he afraid you would yell out? Yeah, that's the reason why he taped my mouth shut. What did he use? Um, duct tape, and he'll put a dirty, nasty sock in my mouth. So I could not, like, you know, move the tape with my lips to get it off. Yeah. Let me ask you this. 
What was your relationship with him? What did you say to I him? I never talked to him. I hated him. Did you tell him you hated him? Did you tell him to leave yes. you alone? Did you let me go? What did you say? I told him that he was a monster. Were you afraid he would hurt you? more when you said you're a monster, I hate you? At the point of time, I really didn't care because it was either I was going to die or I was not. Was there a time that you thought you would rather just die? Yes, but that would be taking the easy way out. And I want my son to know me as a victor, not a victim. And I wanted him to know that I survived loving him. His love got me through. Could you see his face clearly in your mind? Yeah. Could you hear his little voice? Say, Mommy, please don't do it. I need you. It's very brave, Michelle. You said that he told you, I'm going to keep you chained to this pole until I can trust you. Yeah. Define trust. What did he mean? Until I submitted to him and I did nothing wrong, like trying to escape. And so what would you do to try to make him less suspicious, to make him trust you more? I would like change things that I said and I'll be like, well, you're not bad. You're just a little abnormal and it's okay. Everybody does something wrong. I will let him know that there's like places out there for him to go where he can get help and he don't have to do this anymore. That w was a brilliant strategy. Very smart. The FBI interrogators will tell you one of the best things to do is trivialize what they've done. It seemed to work because at some point he did move you from the basement, right? Yes. But then when I got up there, it was like he turned into a jackal and hide. He'll start saying things like, um, "You, you did something wrong. If you do something wrong again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hurt you." It's like, who are you talking to? I didn't do anything. And then I try to, I'll be like this. Well, we could watch a movie together. I'll turn it around and I'll make him feel like I want him in the room. You could defuse him sometimes. Yes. Right. There is a picture in here of the room he moved you to, correct? Yes. I was basically chained to the bed. When you were in this room, you said he had to get the chain just right so you could go to the bathroom. Are you still using a bucket in the bedroom that he yeah. put you in up there? I only had this much chain space, so I couldn't, like, reach a window or anything. Windows were taped shut or? Boarded. Boarded. No possible way to see out or anybody to see in. You, you couldn't see the sky. You couldn't see a cloud. You couldn't see anything. No. So tell me about life in this first room that you were in. What was your existence like in that space? Lonely, <clears throat> scared, always praying to God to pop the locks or do something because I needed to get out of here. I cry daily, and he will always yell at me for crying, always. You're not supposed to cry. You're supposed to be happy. You're kidnapped, chained to a bed, held captive, but you're supposed to be happy. That's his delusional thinking. Yeah, that was his little fairy tale world. Is this a door or a window, or what do we That's a door where he kept the alarm on. So there's an alarm here? Yeah. Okay. What happened in that room? A lot of abuse. When he did abuse me, it was like f lasted for maybe like three, four hours. And he'll stop, take a break in between, and come back. Take me through one of those three or four hour sessions. He'll proceed to have sex with me. He'll ask me, do I like it? He'll ask me to say a certain phrase, and if I didn't say it, he would just keep on punching me and punching me until I say it. No matter how, how much pain, I try not to say it, because I didn't want to say it. But eventually I said it, so he'll leave me alone. How did you feel when you said it? 
dirty, disgusted of myself. That was a failure. He had won that round. Yeah. Were there times when you would never say it? Yes. And uh, I'll say, well, if you want me to say it, you might as well just kill me. Because I'm not going to say it again. So he'll put the, the stenchic cord around my neck, and he'll start to choke me. And then I'll just pass out. Did you ever have a dog? Yeah. Tell me about your dog. He was the sweetest dog I ever had. One day, my dog decided to protect me, bit him, and he broke his neck right in front of me. How did he break his neck? Picked him up, turned his neck. All I heard was a yelp, and he was gone. What did you say when he killed your dog? I called him a bastard. What did he do with the dog? He buried it in the backyard. Coming up. What tipped you off that you weren't the first girl that he had done this to? He showed me an area that's in his basement that says, rest in peace. We now return to a Dr. Phil exclusive. Ariel Castro's first victim speaks out. Tell me what you said to yourself when he finally left the room, closed the door, locked you in, and you were alone again. I said, thank God he left. That's all I will say. And then I'll fall asleep praying for my lock to be popped. And then finally, one time, he decided to take me downstairs, and I found a needle. And I picked the lock, and then he leaves, but I didn't know he was in his backyard. And I tried to escape. And then he comes running up the stairs. I'm panicking. I'm halfway out the window. I run back to the bed, chain myself in the best way I could, and I just pretended like nothing happened. But I kept the pen underneath my um, pillow and he found it and he was like, what are you doing with this? And I pretended that I carved something in my arm. So he took the pen and he was like, don't do that. It's not good to self mutilate. So he was like, I'm gonna leave you up here. I'm gonna get you later to take a shower. So you left, and that's the last time that I had a chance to get out. And did he take you for a shower? Yes. It was the only shower I got for a year. It was my punishment for trying to escape. But did he know you tried to escape? Oh, yeah. The chain wasn't put on right. He figured it out. Oh, so in that moment, he didn't figure it out, but then yeah. he did figure it out. Mm -hmm. So days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months. It comes Christmas time. Are you aware that it's the holiday season? Yeah. He'll rub it in my face that I wasn't with my son. What would he say? Your son is spending holidays with somebody else, and you won't be able to spend holidays with him until I feel like letting you go. So he knew how important your son was to you, so he would throw that up in your face? Yeah. And he'll say that he's better off without you. What would you say to him when he would say that to you? I would ask him how he felt when his wife took his kids away from him. And so that puts us in to the winter time of that first year. Does anything stand out to you about that time? It's always very cold. He didn't have heat, and I only had one sheet. You didn't have blankets? No. How, how cold did it get in your room? So cold that my lips would turn blue, and you could see my breath. What did you wear when you were in the room? I was just basically naked. I didn't have clothes at all. No clothes? None. Did you ever tell him 
look, I'm freezing in here. Give me some clothes. Give me some blankets. Yeah. He'll look at me and he'll be like, well, you don't need clothes and anything to stay warm. You're only here for one thing and that's it. And he'll just be like, well, when I trust you enough to give you clothes, I'll go out and buy you clothes. If it didn't go by his book, then I didn't get the covers, I didn't get the clothes. I didn't get food or anything else if it wasn't the way he wanted it to be. Did he ever take you back down into the basement? Yes. And he made me stay down there for a long time. And it's a lot colder in the basement than it is up in the room. So you're barefooted, naked. On cement. Nothing still. but chains on the cement. Mm-hmm. Did you ever ask him why he was being so mean to you? He said because he hated me. That's the only thing he said to me is because I hate you. Did you ever get pregnant with him that first year? We now return to a Dr. Phil exclusive. Ariel Castro's first victim speaks out. Did you ever get pregnant with him that first year? Yeah. So tell me about this first time that you figure out you're pregnant. Did he figure it out too? Yeah, I didn't tell him. I didn't want to. I was scared. And then finally he was like, I think you are pregnant. And then I was like, okay, what do you want me to do about that? He was like, I'm gonna do something about it. That's when he punched me in my stomach. How did he do that? I was standing up and he punched me with a barbell. He took the round part and he went like this. And he f made it go up so I could hit the lower area of my stomach. I fell to the floor. He just knocked you down. What did he say? And he said, tomorrow it better be gone. That's all he said. And then when I did miscarry, he blamed me. He said I hated him that I killed his kid. And he punched me in the face, saying that it was all my fault. How did you feel when you knew that the pregnancy was over? I felt bad for the child. You know, some women would say, I I'm glad I don't want to have a child with this monster, which I know you didn't, but you still had compassion for the baby. We've gone through eight months here. What tipped you off that you weren't the first girl that he had done this to? He kept on repeating, don't think you're the only one. And he kept on repeating it and repeating it. And then he showed me an area that's in his basement that says, rest in peace. But the name he scribbled out, I couldn't really see because I didn't have glasses. Right. Tell me about him telling you that he was hunting for replacements. He will always say, I seen this girl. I'm just sad that I didn't get her in my car. He would let me know what girl he was trying to abduct and where she worked. On April 21st, he takes Amanda Berry. How did you first learn that there was another victim in the house? Coming up. Was she chained? I didn't see the chain until so she like moved her leg because it was around her ankle. Turn to a Dr. Phil exclusive. Ariel Castro's first victim speaks out. Amanda Berry, 17 years old, didn't come home from her job at Burger King three weeks ago. The greatest hope is that my sister comes home. Mandy, I love you. If you can get a hold of me, please call me. People love you. We will leave the details of the stories of Gina De Jesus and Amanda Berry for them to tell if and when they wish to do so. What you're about to hear is Michelle's recollections of the experiences the three women shared while in captivity. How did you first learn that there was another victim? The news. Okay, how is it that you were able to watch TV now? He finally gave me a broken down TV 
but I seen her picture and I didn't know her name until they like pasted it across the This screen. was in your room? Yeah. And I had a feeling the reason why he turned on the TV is because he wanted me to know that there was another girl in the house. A couple weeks later, he brings a girl in my room and he says it's his brother's girlfriend. I knew that was a lie because of the way she looks. How did she look? She looked just like Amanda, and she was wearing a pair of boy pajamas. And did she have a top on? Yeah, she actually had clothes, which was odd to me because I didn't have any. When she came in my room, and I was covering myself with a blanket like this, so she couldn't see. You were embarrassed? Yes, very. And at the time she came in my room, my room was like full of garbage, knee high. There's old pizza, you know, there's like spoiled, you know, sandwiches on the floor, you know, because he wouldn't take it out. He would leave it there. And there was like flies flying around the room. It was pretty disgusting. How did he behave with her? How did he react with her when he brought her in? Was she chained up, tied up? No, she didn't have chains or anything on her. The only one that did was me, and he made me cover it before she came in the room. So how long after you saw on the television that a girl had been taken, how long between there and when he brought her in your room? Weeks. Weeks. What happened when he brought her in the room? He said, all right, this is my brother's girlfriend. Was she crying? Was she? No, she smiled at me because I think she was happy to see that there was another person there and it wasn't just her. She wasn't alone. Did she look beat up or anything? No. Was she clean? I didn't see any dirt or anything. Like on my legs, you would have seen black dirt. She looked like she wanted to cry though, but she didn't cry. How long was it before you saw her again? A long while. Was it like several days or several weeks? I think it was more than like these months. Months before you see her again? Yeah. So he, he brings her? He brings me in the room. Basically, I was embarrassed to walk in the room because I was fully naked. And I didn't want to walk in front of her being naked. And he was like, well, she got the same thing you have. You can come in the room. This We're is gonna in go whose room? His Amanda's. room? Amanda's. This is when I finally got to see where she was at. We're sitting there, we're talking, and um, she told me that, I think I remember you from school. I was like, yeah, I remember you. Was she chained? I didn't see the chain until she like moved her leg because it was around her ankle. But she was chained? Mm-hmm. Did you talk to her then? Were you ever alone? No, never alone. At that point, at least? Always with him. So how often in, in these ensuing months, did you see Amanda? So how often in these ensuing months did you see Amanda? Not that often. And when we did, it was like a quick hug and bye because he wouldn't let us stay in the same room for that long. And when he would leave for work, did you two yell out to each other? No, we weren't allowed. If I, I'm pretty sure if we did, we would have got in trouble. So you, you didn't know if he was there or gone or? But if her mom was on TV or something, I would blast my TV so she can hear me, so she can turn on hers. And then I'll quickly turn down because you never know when, you, when he's there. And if you do something wrong, if you do something get defiant, hurt. then you're going to get hurt. How many times did you see her during that first year? Maybe six or seven times. And sometimes she would cry. And I'll tell her everything will be okay. And that one day we'll get home. We just have to, you know, wait it out. We've only just begun to scratch the surface of what took place inside that house that once stood at 2207 Seymour Avenue. Tomorrow, Michelle reveals the moment she knew Castro had added a third young girl, 14-year-old Gina De Jesus, to his prison. Tomorrow on Dr. Phil. I had to help him drill holes in a wall to put the chains through to hook us together.
He was forcing you to prepare a torture chamber for a new victim. In the basement, all I could hear is a girl screaming, get off of me. And he tells me I hate you because I can abuse you and nobody will care. The stories no one has heard. He had you digging back here. Was this a grave? From Ariel Castro's House of Horrors. Gina picks me up and so her arms. I begged her to let me die. That's tomorrow. If you've been touched by Michelle Knight's story and you want to make a donation for her future, go to drphil.com. The Dr. Phil Foundation is setting up a donation fund for Michelle, and we are starting her off with a substantial donation. Every single penny will go straight to her. There is no one more deserving of our help than this brave young woman. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.